Good morning, everybody. It is great to see everyone here this morning. We're grateful for your presence. Uh, I want to echo also a welcome to our visitors. We're glad that you're here this morning and uh, thankful that you've made the decision to worship with us. You know, I always love being at services because you learn something new many times if you'll just listen. And uh, I had no idea of Steve's fondness for the cookie monster, but um, I, I'm glad to know that now. I'm not the only one, evidently. Johnson Oatman Jr. was his name. He was born April 21st, 1856 in Bedford, New Jersey. And he was born into a religious family. Uh, it was common practice for the family to go to worship every Sunday. And faith was just a part of who they were as a family. His dad was kind of a big man that uh, had a fondness for music. He had this deep, booming voice. And one of Johnson's favorite childhood memories, actually, was sitting by his dad's side and for hours they would sing church hymns. So as Johnson got older and matured, he was thinking about what he wanted to do with his life, and in some way he wanted to honor his father's faith. So he made the decision to enroll in seminary and become a minister. And he would graduate from seminary and he would move from church to church. He never seemed to spend very long in any one church. And by his own admission, he would say he wasn't a very good preacher. So by the age of 36, he decided to do something different. And in 1892, one night, he sat down with pen in hand and paper and he would pen the words to the first song that he ever wrote. Within three years, churches all over the world would be singing his hymns. One of his personal favorites was titled, No, Not One. But in 1897, he would write what would become his personal favorite hymn of all times, a song most of us have probably sung titled, Count Your Blessings. This past week, we paused as a nation to think about thanksgiving and giving thanks and I think all of us understand and recognize that the idea of counting our blessings is not something reserved for one day. And I think all of us try really hard to think about how God has blessed us, but sometimes it can just be challenging with the busyness of life. This morning, I ask you to open your Bibles with me to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I want us to consider just the opening verses, the first five verses of this particular psalm. As we think about this idea of counting our blessings and maybe look through the eyes of the psalmist to see how the psalmist approached this topic of counting your blessings. And let's see if we can make some observations together. Let's start by looking at the introduction. And part of the introduction really should just be a step back to think about who wrote this particular psalm and maybe what's just the general outline of the psalm. And you know, the Psalms as a collection are very interesting because you see, they weren't all written by one person. There were actually several different writers to the Psalms. Some Psalms we can say with a high degree of assurance who wrote them. There's historical evidence or evidence within the Psalm itself. Others, not so much confidence that we have behind who wrote them. This particular Psalm is generally attributed to David, although we don't know with full assurance. But for terms of our study this morning, we're just going to assume and work under the assumption that David penned this particular psalm. We don't necessarily know all the details in his life like we might from some other psalms that he wrote, such as Psalm 51. But it's interesting to see how David views the idea of thanksgiving. And the reason that we're going to focus on the first five verses is because those verses deal with the idea of personal thanksgiving. Verses 6 through 12 transition into kind of this national view of thanksgiving, almost as a nation, Israel. And then the remaining verses in this particular psalm shift to this idea of universal thanksgiving. So there's somewhat of a progression. But we'll focus on the first five verses. And I want you to notice simply the first three words that begin this psalm. Bless the Lord. That these three words form kind of the bookends to the entire psalm. If you look at verses 1 and 2, that phrase is used two times. And then notice the closing two verses, three verses. Bless the Lord, O you, His angels, 
you mighty ones who do His work, word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all His host, His ministers who do His will. Bless the Lord, all His works in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Six times in the opening two verses and the final three verses, we see these words, bless the Lord. They really are the heart of this entire psalm. The idea of blessing the Lord, that phrase, it can really have two possible meanings. One is God blessing us, and the other is somehow us blessing God. And context really determines which of the two meanings applies. And in this particular context, David is implying us blessing God. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? There's a, a sense that there's nothing we could do to bless God per se. God is not like us. He doesn't need anything like we might need something. There's nothing that we could necessarily do for God to fulfill Him or complete Him. But yet there is a profound sense in all of Scripture that we can bless God through our serving and through our worship. And I believe with everything as we look at this psalm, that the idea that David is getting across is blessing the Lord through our expression of worship specifically, but really through our whole lives. So David says, bless the Lord, but how, in what way, with what do we bless the Lord? And he answers that question, oh, my soul. That word soul is a word that's found a lot through Scripture. And it really takes us to the very inner being of a person. It's the seat within a person where everything else springs forth. Emotion, intellect, reason, logic, everything. So David, in essence, says, bless the Lord, beginning within the very deepest part of a person, and everything springs forth out of that in every aspect of life. So David starts this idea of counting his blessings, the idea of thanksgiving by saying, give something back to God. Give everything within you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You see, the name of the Lord meant something to David. It was something special. He recognized it as holy. This morning in our adult Bible class, Warren led a conversation, a discussion about prayer, and he brought up three different words. Respect, reverence, and awe as they relate to God. And part of those three ideas, I believe, is connected with this idea of holiness and how His name is holy. And David says, He's going to bless the Lord. He's going to give back thanksgiving, worship, service, with everything that he has in him, every aspect of his being, he's going to bless the holy name of God in every way. But at the same time, it almost seems, if you look at verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That maybe David is almost wrestling with this idea that it's hard sometimes to remember everything that God has done. Maybe in some ways David wrestled with the same things that we do. Maybe the busyness of life that, that distracts us from pausing and reflecting. And it's almost like this inner conflict where David doesn't want to forget. He doesn't ever want to let go of the memory of everything that God has done to bless his life. So just these first two verses, we get some insight into David's mind and his way of thinking. And how counting his blessings and how the idea of thanksgiving was something that was vitally important to David, but also maybe something that didn't always come as natural as we might think when we look back at the life of David. But as we move on from the introduction, we look at the specific items of thanksgiving that David recognized. We're going to see five things that David lists here that he was thankful for. And I believe out of these five things that David lists, we could see any number of thousands upon thousands of blessings that all flow from these five things. Let's look at verse number three. 
Who forgives all your iniquity? I find it interesting that David starts with the idea of forgiveness. That's the first thing that comes to David's mind when he wants to remember all that God has done. When he thinks about this idea of don't forget all of his benefits, he thinks about the concept of forgiveness. You know, I guess if there was ever a person that lived that could truly have an appreciation of what God's forgiveness meant in his or her life, it would be David, wouldn't it? I think most, if not all of us here this morning, know stories of David's life, significant events. Maybe one of the first things we think about is David and Goliath and one of the high moments of his life where he displayed this incredible trust and confidence in God. We think about how David was faithful in terms of his service to Saul, but yet David's life was littered with sin as well. Lust, adultery, murder, deception. I mean, he had elements of his life that would provide enough material for any type of made-for-TV movie, but yet David experienced God's forgiveness. And David appreciated God's forgiveness. And let's notice some things about God's forgiveness in this particular psalm. Look at verses 10 through 12 with me. The psalmist would say, David would say, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Allow those words to sink in for just a minute. God doesn't deal with us according to our sins. Man, that's the top of the, at the, of the list of our blessings, isn't it? I mean, if God dealt with me according to my sin, I, I, I would be in incredible fear. And David, you think about the sins that he committed, and he recognized because of God's steadfast love and His grace and His mercy, God didn't deal with him in the way that he ultimately deserved. So God's forgiveness is complete in every way. It's far-reaching as far as the east from the west. As far as He can, He removes those transgressions from us. You see, it's complete. It's far-reaching. God's forgiveness is effective in every way it needs to be in order for David to fully comprehend and understand God's love for him. And you see, really... It's impossible to truly enjoy every other blessing that God might provide without having this benefit or blessing of forgiveness first. This is where it all starts. From this, everything else flows in terms of David's thankfulness. He moves from forgiveness to healing. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? That word diseases, that's a word that we use a lot in our language and in our culture, but it's kind of interesting. It really wasn't a very frequently used word in the Old Testament. And it's kind of a broad term. It can mean a lot of different things. It could mean what we might normally think of in terms of physical illnesses. And perhaps David is struggling with some type of illness or disease in his life. Maybe there's multiple things. But it is a broad term, and it also can deal with spiritual illness and disease and there's a part of me that thinks maybe that's what David's really thinking about here because it fits in with the concept of forgiveness. It fits in with what follows and some of the other things that David is thankful for. But David talks about his healing power. It's not just that God forgives, but you see, sin leaves scars, and sometimes those scars are consequences, and David certainly had consequences for his sins. David's home became shambles. There's just this distinguished difference in David's life prior to his sin with Bathsheba and after. But sin can also carry emotional scars. And if we allow it in our own lives, we allow that baggage to turn into spiritual scars. But David says God has the ability not just to forgive, but to bring healing. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the healing that Jesus brings through the cross. And He has the ability to heal relationships between people. 
that would never be able to be healed under any other circumstances than through the power that Jesus brought through the cross. But it also brought healing between man and between God. And David recognized the incredible benefit of healing that God could provide. Sometimes physically, but always the ability to heal spiritually. So he talks about the benefit of forgiveness, the benefit of healing. Look at verse number four. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. It's not just forgiveness. It's not just healing. There's also this idea of redemption that comes along. It's kind of an interesting word. The word actually means the redeeming quality that would come along through a kinsman. And that's not something that you and I think about in our culture. We really don't have this concept of kinsman redeemer in our culture per se. But in Jewish culture, this was a vitally important concept. Maybe you're familiar with the Old Testament story of Ruth and Boaz. You see, Ruth found herself in a situation where her husband and her sons had all died. And she was now alone. And in Jewish culture, that was a bad situation for her to be in. She had lost family land. She had no one to provide for her needs. And she struggled just to find scraps to provide for herself, much less for her mother-in-law that was with her as well. But you see, there was someone that she was related to, a man named Boaz. And in Jewish culture, he had a responsibility, in essence, to redeem her, to bring her back so that she could regain her family status, to help provide her, if possible, a son that could carry on her family name and help provide for her needs. And that's really kind of the idea behind that word. It's this restoration of family relationship and family benefits. And David says that God is a redeemer who brings us back from the pit. That word pit is a reference to death. And if indeed the concept here is spiritual in nature, there's forgiveness, there's spiritual healing, but there's also spiritual redemption that restores that family relationship between David and between God. That's profound. When you think about all that David had been through, the sin that was in his life that was recorded, that has been preserved for thousands of years so that you and I know about it. You know, in many ways, we're kind of lucky. Most of our sin can be confined to maybe just a few people. And at times, maybe even just ourselves. David's was public in every way. And David says, I'm thankful for the benefit that my family relationship can be restored. Why? Why can it be restored? He gives, I guess, at least part of the answer in the second half of verse 4. There's forgiveness, there's healing, there's redemption, and there's God's everlasting love. David describes it as a crown. The idea of this incredibly ornate and decorated crown coming down and resting on David's head. But that word crown also has this idea of surrounding. Think about that idea for just a minute. The incredible benefits of God, His blessings coming down upon David, resting upon his head in this beautifully ornate way. But they don't just stay there. They encompass, they completely surround David where they are all around him. We talk about the idea of God's blessings coming down, raining down upon us. What an incredibly beautiful and poetic picture. And David says, that's a benefit of God. In verse 5, who satisfies you with good. In every way, God's benefits, His blessings, they satisfy our deepest needs. And here's what's amazing when you really stop and think about it. Some of our needs are universal. We have a universal need for forgiveness. We have a universal need for spiritual healing. But you really think about the idea of what our individual sins are and some of the scars that they can leave, and some of the emotional struggles we might have in overcoming those, that can become kind of personal, can it? That can start to get different for me and for you. And David says, satisfies with God's 
goodness. Forgiveness, healing, redemption, steadfast love, and God's goodness. Five things that David recognizes as benefits that, God's, that God provides. And if you think about it, out of those five things, every other blessing or benefit really flows. They all start with those five basic concepts. And David recognized where his life would be without those benefits in his life. And David says, don't let me ever forget those benefits in my life. But you see, there's implications. It's not just items of thanksgiving. There's an implication of what these things meant to David's life. And look at the last half of verse 5. So, the purpose of all these benefits, that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, this did something for David's life. It didn't physically take him back in years. He didn't physically go from, I, I mean, I don't know what age he would have been here. We'll just make something up. He didn't physically go from 55 back to 25. That's not the concept. The concept is it renewed his inner being to being like it was new again. And he uses the idea of an eagle. You know, we're blessed to live in a place where we get to see all different kinds of wildlife. I don't care how many times you've seen an eagle, there's just something majestic about it, isn't there? The idea of power and swiftness. What an incredible symbol to illustrate how David felt inwardly because of these incredible blessings. Not the first time this idea of an eagle and restoration has been used. I think about the idea of Isaiah chapter 40 and I put this verse on the screen, but I invite you just to turn there because I think the verses prior to verse 31 are incredibly important in appreciating verse 31. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse number 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall feel exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, David understood the strength that came from God's benefits. Where would David's life have been without those five benefits or blessings that God provided? How do you think David would have felt emotionally, spiritually? You see, David's relationship with God had been an important part of his whole life. And he knew. He knew what his sin had done with that relationship. And if it wasn't for God's forgiveness, His healing, His redemption, His love, His goodness, David knew that he would have suffered for the rest of his life. It would have taken every bit of emotion and energy he had and just sucked it out of him to the point that I'm sure he felt like he wouldn't have even been able to go on. But because of those benefits... David's strength was able to be renewed to the point that it was like he was young again. You see, that's the power of the benefits of God's redemption and forgiveness and His goodness and His love. And David recognized the implication of that in his own life. But it's interesting to look at it through the eyes of David. It's interesting to think about what it meant in his life but what's the application for you and for me? What about our lives? How do these five verses impact our way of thinking? When we think about those five things that David was thankful for, forgiveness and healing and redemption and everlasting love and God's goodness, what about us and our lives? One of the things I'm always fascinated about, and I've mentioned this before when I preach from the Psalms, is you think about David's life and his view of God. 
He had an incredibly high view of God, didn't he? He knew who God was. He appreciated what God had done for him. And yet the promise of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the completed redemption, redemptive work of Christ, David never got to experience that. I want you to think about something. I want to stay in the Old Testament, actually. And if you're in Isaiah, turn just a few pages over to Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to guess that Isaiah 53 might be the most well-known messianic chapter in all of Scripture. Certainly one of the most powerful. The words in this particular prophecy are cutting. They're deep. And I want to start just reading in verse number 4. These words are pointing to the coming Messiah. But they're written as if they are, have already happened. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You think about the idea of forgiveness. It starts, even for David, it really truly starts with the cross. Even though David never saw it in its fullness, even though David never lived under that cross, David received the benefits of that cross just like you and I do. You think about healing. We've already mentioned Ephesians chapter 2. You and I have the opportunity to experience healing in a way that David never did. We experience it by seeing God in flesh, His example, His life. We experience healing by seeing His pain and suffering. By seeing us in the crowd, by recognizing that it it should have been us on that cross, but seeing God's love for us by allowing Jesus to hang on that cross in our behalf. We see the healing that results from that tomb being empty and the resurrection. We see how relationships can be restored. How hope can exist. When things seem hopeless, we see redemption. How the cross restores our family relationship with God. How we can be called His children. How we can experience being brothers with the one that suffered and died on that cross. We think about God's everlasting love. We will never be able to truly comprehend the love that God has for us by allowing what happened on that cross to happen. We think about God's goodness. There's nothing in our lives that deserve that. Nothing. 
was entirely because of God's goodness toward us, because of His grace and His mercy. And you think about the words to this particular psalm, how profound they are in terms of our lives and what they mean to us. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? God does. And He does it for us through the cross. What should our response be to that cross? It should be the same as David's. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. It should control every aspect of our lives in our response to God's benefits as we count our blessings should be that it starts in the deepest part of our emotion and it emanates in every way of our life from there. In our work, in our homes, and in our worship, and in our community. There's no aspect of our life that isn't impacted by the benefits that God gives to us. We're going to sing a song, and as we sing that song, maybe it's a good time just to stop and count our blessings. And as we do, maybe you'll need encouragement. Maybe you need us to pray with you. Maybe you just need to feel the love of, of God's family. Maybe you want to know Jesus more. If there's any way we can help you this morning, just let us know now while together we stand and sing.